Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about walls of origin and how British importers can make use of them for EU trade. Brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade with Digital Trader Services. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be host for this afternoon. And thank you all for joining us today. A lot of you are already on the line. So uh, we're just over a month away from import declarations being required for all goods entering Britain at the point of entry into the country. So this is clearly a topic of great importance. So thank you for joining. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you'll see we've got a lot to cover today. To begin with, we'll be hearing about the importance of rules of origin and how they work before hearing about how British importers can claim preferential origin on their goods to remove tariffs on imports from the EU under the terms of the UK-EU trade deal. And we'll then answer some of your questions about these processes. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, you will have the opportunity to scan a QR code at different points of the webinar if you'd like to find out more information about the solutions to digital trader services are providing to traders with these new declaration requirements. I will also shortly share a link in the chat room through which you can register your interest in digital trader services. Next slide, please. And on this side, you can see a little bit more about our speakers today. And you will be sent a PDF of this side pack so you can read more about their illustrious CVs later on. But for now, a quick introduction. We'll first be hearing from Amy Mortman, the Deputy to the Director of the Institute's Academy. Uh, Amy will be talking about what all walls of origin are. We'll then hear from Paul Woodward, a trade and customs specialist at the Institute's Academy, and Paul will guide you through how to claim preferential origin for your goods. And we're also delighted to be joined by Frank Dunsmere, Head of International Trade and Customs at Fujitsu, who will tell us a little bit more about the customs expertise and support that digital trader services is provided to traders who may be new to competing declarations in 2022. Next slide, please. So before handing over to Amy, we're gonna launch the first of a few polls we're gonna be running today. And this is just to gauge uh, your awareness of wars of origin for UK-EU trade uh, as set by the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement. While you are answering that poll, just a couple more housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions used from the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions during the Q&A today, but please note we cannot guarantee that we'll be able to answer every question in the allocated time. And also a quick tip, the more concise and easy to read your questions are, the more likely I am to ask them, so please try to be concise. Secondly, uh, as already noted, you will receive access to today's side pack and a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we, we will be sending before the end of the week. So please do try to listen in as carefully as you can to today's uh, discussions and presentation. So I'll just give you a couple more seconds to answer that poll. And we'll now share the results. So really interesting, most of you are aware to some extent. So 13% very aware, 53% quite aware, 29% not very aware, and only 3% not at all aware. Um, so good to see some awareness there, but hopefully we, we can uh, improve our awareness a little bit more today. Enough of me though, thanks everyone for answering the poll and uh, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Amy on the next slide who will begin today's presentations. Over to you, Amy. Thank you very much, Will. Um, can you just confirm you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I um, hope everybody is well. So in today's webinar, and we'll introduce the concept of rules of origin and how to get to grips of them um, and why they matter in the context of moving goods. So interestingly, in the poll prior, um, you know, there was an indication that people are already aware of them. They can be very complex and I'll do my best to explain. Um, and we have some um, examples to run through in the, the, the coming slides. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so just a quick reminder, and I'm sure everybody's aware of this, but the UK government um, announced a number of easements under the UK's border operating model, um, which has now been renamed to the border with the European Union. 
Um, and there was an easement in place for UK importers who import non-controlled goods to allow them the option to delay declarations for the goods up in, um, for a period of up to 175 days. So important note that from January 2022, traders who move goods will need to make full customs declarations at the point of import and pay any relevant tariffs. Okay, so delaying declarations is no longer an option. So UK importers can make use of the UK and EU trade and cooperation agreement, which in turn would reduce those tariffs to zero, but they need to make sure that they understand the rules of origin and we'll talk about those in more detail today. Next slide, please. So what are rules of origin? Um, put very simply, um, rules of origin determine the economic nationality of an item. And there are two different types of origin in existence. And it's very difficult. Sometimes you get asked the question about how do I determine origin? And my first question back is always, what will you be using that for? OK, so there are two different types. So non-preferential origin, and as the name may suggest, is the origin of a good, regardless of whether there's a free trade agreement in place. And why is that important? That's used to determine whether trade remedy measures like anti-dumping duty might exist, um, import and export license requirements, labelling requirements, to name a few. Um, and today the focus will be on preferential origin rules because those are the rules that are used to determine whether lower or nil rates of duty can be applied where there's a free trade agreement between two or more partner countries. Okay, so we'll focus on that today. Um, and the rules to arrive at preferential and non-preferential origin are different. And it, um, it is actually possible for a product, believe it or not, to have two different origins. Okay. So under the EU and UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, only goods which have EU preferential origin can be imported into the UK at the preferential or nil rate of duty. Okay. Um, so just a, a quick kind of um, reminder for companies before we go on to look at the, the rules of origin in more detail. Within the UK, there's a unified tariff schedule for goods that are moving in from countries, all third countries, and that's called the UK Global Tariff. And within the UK Global Tariff, lots of products have already got a nil rate of duty, regardless of whether there's a free trade agreement in place. So I would always suggest the companies to check what duty rates applicable to their goods and they do that using the commodity code, and we'll talk about that in more detail today as well. But um, you know, if your duty rate for your goods is already zero, um, there's really no need to make a claim for preferential origin, and you might um, reduce the amount of min uh, administrative burden. So check that first. And there is a tool within the uh, gov.uk website called uh, the Trade Tariff Lookup Tool. So always visit there first, input your commodity code, and um, get an understanding of what the tariff rate is for your goods. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the more complex area, which is uh, origin rules, okay, and put, put quite loosely, there are four types of rules that are in, in existence within the UK and EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Okay, so for every product traded um, under a free trade agreement, there is a corresponding product specific rule or PSR. And that must be met to demonstrate that the product originates in the free trade area and therefore qualifies for preferential treatment. In other words, to reduce the, the duty to zero. Um, and there might be a choice of a rule that a company has, and you, you'll see that by the, the word or. Um, or there might be more than one rule that needs to be met, and you'll see the word and in that situation. So the rule describes the nature or the value of the process and that needs to be carried out. Okay, and we'll introduce these now and then we'll go on and look at a couple of examples. So firstly, there are goods which must be wholly obtained. And we'll go through these in more detail, but um, put simply, goods are wholly obtained if they are exclusively produced in a country that's covered by the trade agreement without incorporating materials from any other country. The second rule um, is change in tariff uh, classification or commodity code. And that means that your final product cannot have the same commodity code as any of the materials from third countries other than the EU or the UK. Okay, so if that rule applies to your goods, it will state manufacture from materials of any other heading except that of the product. 
There's a third type, and that's the value added rule, and that sets a limit on the value of materials that um, a third country um, from a uh, sorry that sets the limit on the value of materials from a third country within the final product, and normally that's based and expressed as the percentage of the final value of your product. And then lastly, specified processes. Okay, and that rule defines either specific materials that can be used or the processes that need to have been undertaken in either the UK or the, e, uh, the EU for your goods to qualify. So the rule that might apply will always be determined by your commodity code. Okay, and Paul will talk about how to identify the rules that apply later in the webinar. So next slide, please. Okay, so look, looking firstly at wholly obtained, that rule applies mainly to basic agricultural products, fishery products, minerals, waste and scrap. So not applicable for all products, but um, it means that goods have to be exclusively produced in either the UK or the EU without incorporating materials from other countries. So products like live animals born and raised in a particular country or products obtained from fishing or hunting are, are examples. Okay, so. If we go through the first example, please, um, it's of horses which are born and raised in France and subsequently brought um, to the UK. So the GB importer can claim that the horses are um, of French preferential origin because they were wholly obtained in France. And that means that they're then eligible for zero rates of duty rather than applying and the normal 10% import duty that would apply to horses under the UK global tariff. And if we look at the next example, please, um, grapes grown in Portugal. And again, this is clearly a case of the grapes were fully produced in Portugal. Um, and as such, then those grapes qualify for preferential origin rather than the 8 to 14% um, that would normally apply to them. Um, and the wholly obtained rule is much clearer um, because there's less um, um, ambiguity. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the more complex rules um, is the change in tariff classification. Um, and if this rule is applicable to your product, it will be indicated within the TCA. And you'll see um, one of these terms, either CC, CTH or CTSH. Okay, And at, at high level, this means that your goods cannot have the same commodity code as any of the materials sourced from the third countries that have been used to make up your product. Um, so in or order to determine whether goods meet this rule, companies are required to know the commodity code of the final product and the commodity codes of the materials that they sourced from third countries to make that product. Okay, And there needs to be a comparison exercise um, to determine whether the commodity codes are the same. So we'll come on to look at commodity codes now in the next slide. And you'll hear the term commodity code. We use that a lot in the UK. In other countries, they have different um, terms that they use. So you might hear um, HS codes, harmonized tariff codes, tariff classifications. There's a, um, a whole host of different terms. And the commodity code's a sequence of numbers um, made up of eight, 10 or 14 digits, and it's used to identify goods. Um, and they're used to determine import tariffs, other measures, import and export license requirements. And importantly, and in, in, um, you know, in, in comparison to what we're talking about today, used to determine whether your goods meet the rules of origin. So it's really important that the commodity codes held um, are correct, as this can also impact tariffs, but it can impact rules of origin determination as well. Um, and there's lots of different places to go for advice in terms of finding the right commodity code. And the government website has lots of guidance in this area. So next slide, please. So we'll run through an example of um, how the CTH or um, change in tariff classification rule might be used. So we have a television and it's manufactured in Poland using materials from various countries, including um, other countries other than the EU and the UK. The first thing that a company would do is identify the commodity code for the television. And you can see it on the screen at 5285900. And the company has a choice between CTH or max norm, and we'll cover max norm later. So if we ignore that for now, um, in order to meet the CTH complete tariff heading change rule, 
The rule can be fulfilled if the television is ma um, manufactured from materials sourced from third countries, as long as those materials have a different commodity code than 8528 at a four digit level. So if there's component materials used with the same um, tariff heading 8528, they can meet, the company can meet the rule as long as those um, materials were sourced from the EU or the UK. Um, you need to have proof of origin for those materials um, and we'll talk about that more later on. Paul will cover that. Okay, next slide please. So the value add rule um, basically sets a limit of materials that can be sourced from outside the EU and the UK. Um, so that means if an EU producer, for example, sources material high value items from third countries, they need to be adding substantial value or materials to them in order for them to qualify for preferential origin. And this rule is indicated by the terminology max norm, and that term means the maximum value of non-originating materials, and that's expressed as a percentage of the X-Works value of the product. So the best way to explain this rule is to run through this example. So we've got a bike made in the Netherlands um, using parts from Japan, and the tariff heading is 8712, um, and the rule that applies is max norm 45%. And that means that the value of non-originating materials used in production of the bike cannot exceed 45% of the X-Works price of the bike. And when we say X-Works price, you might hear that um, quite a bit. That's the price that's payable for the product by the customer, minus taxes and duties and freight, but it can include labor, profit and overheads. Okay, so quite complex. So in this example, the value of the Japanese originating materials cannot exceed 45% of the value of the bike. Okay, and it's important. It's incumbent upon the supplier to ensure that they have proof of origin in place for any of the the materials that they are saying are EU or UK in order to meet this rule. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And this last rule is called specified processes, and these rules are really only for certain industries, textiles and chemicals. And this rule defines either specific materials from a country that might be used in the manufacture of a material or the processes that need to have been um, undertaken in either the UK or the EU. So again, I think the best way to explain this is to run through an example. So in this example, we have a cotton t-shirt um, made in Spain and shipped to the UK. The tariff heading is 6109 and the rule that applies is knitting or crocheting combined with making up, including cutting a fabric. So that means that that specified process needs to have taken place in the EU um, for the shirt to be eligible for preferential rates of duty when it's imported into the UK. Okay, so a lot of information. Um, hopefully those examples help um, make kind of a, a bit clearer for you. So um, in the next slide, we'll just cover a couple of other things that companies need to be aware of and considerations. Okay, so tolerance. Um, it's a relaxation of the rules of origin under certain conditions. So it means that even if a product doesn't meet the product specific rule, it can nevertheless be originating if there's only been a limited amount of uh, materials from third countries used. Okay, and normally that's as a weight of the final product. So always check um, the text of the agreement. Um, it's Article Orage 6 of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement because it may be that that's um, an opportunity for companies. The next one shown there is bilateral accumulation um, and that applies and that allows the system to say that goods that were sourced from the EU can be counted as UK originating um, when you're deciding whether goods can meet the rules of origin. So um, that's, you know, where the I'm not sure if everyone's aware of the famous Percy Pig case and um, that's where if a, a company wants to accumulate origin, they, they're allowed to do that, but they need to sufficiently work or process those goods. Okay. So um, it's an important rule to be aware of. If you're bringing goods from the EU and you plan to sell them back to the EU, you need to make sure that you're processing them in, sh in some way in order to be able to uh, provide your EU customer um, evidence of origin. 
insufficient production again simply painting or placing labels onto a product is not enough for them to confer preferential origin so just be aware that the the processing that's taken place needs to be um substantial and there is a list within the trade and cooperation agreement of those processes which do not confer originating status or do not you know aren't um substantial enough for in order for a company to use that processing just also be aware that there's a direct transport rule so preferential agreements um usually contain rules that concern how goods um, are moved from one country to the other and that's really just to make sure that the goods that left one party are the same goods that arrive in the other um, so it could be that if your goods are going through a third country en route um, that they need to remain under transit or within a customs warehouse so just again be wary of, of shipping your goods through third countries en route to um, countries with which you um, the UK has a free trade agreement with and then lastly evidence of origin but I won't be stealing Paul Stunder on that one I think he's going to talk about that this um, quite a bit of detail so um, that's it for me uh, well thank you thanks Amy uh, fantastic to have covered basically all of rules of origin in 15 minutes or so it's such a huge topic so thank you so much uh, for a very thorough presentation we move on to the next slide uh, we'll move on to our second poll um, which is asking do you know if your suppliers can, can can claim that the goods you import are of EU origin? So that's uh, particularly pertinent for importers, of course. And just while people are answering that poll, a couple of questions we've already had in, Amy. So uh, one from Carolyn, who's or Caroline, who's asked, we know what is required to confirm origin when completing an import declaration in 2021. What changes, if any, will there be from 1st of January 2022? Um, it's an interesting one. Um, I guess it's it's at the point where changes are actually going to come in, into play in, in January. So up until, from an origin perspective, the main change is until December this year, if you issue a statement on origin to your customer, um, uh, you don't need to hold suppliers' declarations um, as evidence of the, the, you know, that the goods are of preferential origin, as long as you're confident and you're happy that those goods are eligible. But from January, you must hold a suppliers' declaration at the time you issue, issue a statement on origin to your customer. So if you don't have a suppliers' declaration to show that those goods have originating status, um, you need to make sure there's an obligation on you to let your customer know. Okay. Um, and if you're subject to a request or a verification and you can't provide evidence to show that your goods um, were actually eligible, um, your customer might be li um, liable to pay customs duty. So just ensure in preparation for January 2022 that you've given that some thought. Thanks, Amy. I'm just slightly conscious of time. So we'll leave that one question there for now. I'm just going to share the results of that poll. Uh, so uh, hopefully, encouragingly, 53% of you do know uh, whether your suppliers can claim your goods are your import or EU origin. Only 10% know, but 37% of you not sure. So obviously, a bit of finding out to be doing for for that lot there. But um, if, conscious of time, so I think at this point, if we move on to the next slide, it's on to you, Paul. Thank you, Will, and um, yeah, welcome everybody to. Um, this webinar and um, I'm really happy to be supporting the team in this. So if we're going to look now at claiming preferential origin on EU and GB imports. So can I have the next slide please? Okay, so the first thing that we need to be looking at, as Amy has rightly mentioned, is finding your correct commodity code um, for the product you're using. You can do this by using the online integrated online tariff tool, which Will has kindly put in the chat window today. Um, it is worth noting, though, there has been a recent revision in the last couple of days to make this more easier, more simplified for traders. We're going to show you um, some an element of this now, but it is worth taking note of the things which have changed. So, um, can I have the next, please? So here we can see we've got um, we've got an option here for a cotton shirt um, which has been made in Italy. Um, and as you can see here from this, there are some key areas. There's a new layout there which has been brought into place by HMRC. So how you see that. The first element that we should be looking at here. So can we have the next, please? 
thank you. Um, so when we're looking at finding the commodity code, once you're looking through determining this, then the first arrow here is pointing to selecting your partner country. Now, this is really important um, because obviously the tariff will list every country and what those requirements are. So whether you're importing or exporting to try to understand the rules of origin, you can denote here the country that it's it's originating from. So in, in essence here, you can, you've got Italy in here, and then this will, as an update, minimize all the other requirements and just give you what's right for that, that product. The next one there is the rules of origin tabs. This has recently been added. This is going to allow you to click this tab, do find out about what the rules of origin are, and as Amy rightly said, what are the elements in which you can gain preferential origin? Yeah, it's giving you the, the description um, and how you need to comply with that. Um, so it's really important that once you're looking at your commodity code, you're using the integrated online tariff tool as effective as possible. The final one here is reviewing the actual product specific rules. And these are gonna give you information about description of the rules which are in place, the rule itself, and how you need to attest to get um, preferential origin. It is really worth noting as a, a another update there, um, when we go into the tariff, we have tabs at the top. If you go into the tool section, then there is a very useful tool there in regard to the HS 2020. These are changes happening at the start of next year from the World Trade Organization. Um, and it has a lovely correlation table there to say, if this is your commodity code now, this potentially may be what it's changing to, just so to make sure that you are mitigating for any of these international trade updates that may be occurring. Um, next slide, please. So um, do your rules meet um, the trade cooperation agreements origin rules? So yeah, we need to be looking at this. Remember that, Rules of origin is a criteria needed to determine the national source of that product, not where it's shipped from, but what its na national source is. Um, the importance of this comes from the fact that duties and restrictions under the commodity code depend on where the goods have been sourced from. That's why there's a wide range of variations in practice of governments about the rules of origin, and that is globally. While qualifying goods uh, zero tariff duty will apply, um, we need to, this is not the case for goods which do not meet sufficient processing rule, which Amy has mentioned, yeah? We need to be understanding the clear, clear definitions of non-originating material, originating goods, and wholly obtained. Do remember that goods which are imported from the EU to the UK, which do not undergo sufficient processing in the UK, will not be eligible for tariff preferences if they are re-exported to the EU. In that case, the EU most favoured nation tariff would apply. So really we should be looking here at Annex's origin one and origin two of the trade cooperation agreement to check any product specific rules that there may be for those commodities. So again, key elements here that we should consider, check that import tab on the online integrated tariff tool, yeah? Your supplier might consider adjusting their manufacturing process or supply chain, yeah? Sometimes when we have customs rules and requirements in place, um, traders look at their supply chain as well, so they potentially could source with originating material, reducing the amount of non-originating material that they are including within their products. This then can bring them under tolerances or make them fit that criteria due to especially the, the rates of customs tariffs that, that we could expect on those products. And also, you always worth looking at your procurement process as well. Is there alternative suppliers that you can look at for such goods? Thinking about your whole supply chain and the impacts that rules of origin can place on those products. Next slide, please. So, yes, yeah, so when we're looking at the um, proof of origin under the UK and EU TCA, importers, um, it's really important that you should have evidence to support your claim. Um, 
Currently, you can make statements of origin on your commercial documentation. And obviously, you can declare this by importer's knowledge, which in the next couple of slides, we will, we will get to in, some, in greater detail. But please be aware, if you do not make the goods you export, sometimes you can't know whether they qualify or not. If you haven't made them, you know, you may not know the material, the composition of the bill of material. Remember that the current easement in place, which ends on the 31st of December this year, um, has given this grace period where traders can use importers' knowledge to have these statements made without any requirement until the end of this calendar year to have um, documentation to back up that claim. This is what's known in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement as the Rules of Origin Waiver. Um, also, it, it is important to understand that both goods imported from the EU to the UK and goods imported from the UK to the EU, traders do not need these suppliers' declarations, but they will be necessary from the 1st of January next year. So this is where you purchase goods for onward sale, unaltered, or you need evidence of the originating status of production inputs to calculate those origins of the goods. So from the start of January next year, you must hold supplier declarations at the time that you issue your statement of origin. So let's look at this in real terms. We're issuing that statement of origin, we need proof to back up that claim. If you do not have a supplier's declaration or other information to show your originating status, then there is an obligation for you to let your customer know. If, you're, if you do not have um, these declarations, you'll, there would be a subject for request of verification and you cannot provide evidence to show that the goods that you're importing, exported, have originating status and therefore customs duty will be applicable at its full rate. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the statement of origin, this can be included on any piece of commercial documentation, commercial invoice, um, and it should be associated with the import to declare that the goods are of preferential origin. And in this, you know, there can be a clear statement which is made, followed up by your, if you're an EU um, supplier, that's a registered um, export reference number, also known as a REX number on that statement. Obviously, if you're in the UK, it would be your IORI number. Um, and these can be put there. And again, it's really important when looking at the statement to use that you potentially also include a, a criteria um, sentence which defines how your goods ha meet this originating status. So was it a transformation rule? Was it under tolerance? Max nom, wholly obtained. So these are elements where you can make a statement, but also within that statement, define what that's going to be used for. Next slide, please. So importer's knowledge, I mentioned this previously. So an importer can claim preferential origin by saying they have knowledge of where those goods originate from. Now, this could be challenging in some supply chains where, you know, if you're purchasing that product, how are you actually going to know the composition of that? But it did give the ability to use this importer's knowledge. Um, and when we're looking at this, we should have support, support in documentation. So the commodity code when it's imported, understanding the description of the production process if goods have been altered or transferred in any way. What are the components of that imported product? And understanding which of the, the four elements Amy discussed earlier, those products fall under, wholly obtained. Quite clear there. And some of them obviously will need to be calculated on the value and weight of the end product or non-originating materials that actually have been used in its composition. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so when we're looking at suppliers' declarations, your supplier here will provide you information to prove that the goods comply with the trade cooperation's rules of origin. 
they can be issued on a one-off basis for a particular movement or under long-term declarations if you regularly import the same goods from a supplier. They can also be um, defined by a project range that you would get as long as no, there's no differences between them. Next slide, please. One thing to really consider here, and it's a key element of the considerations, is re-exports. So if you are importing goods into the UK, that then you're going to re-export back to the EU, you need to make sure that you consider sufficient processing, all that value add has actually happened. Um, for an example, you know, if you bring goods in, um, let's say we bring in a garden ornament from the EU, we decide to paint it and polish it. Is that a sufficient process? Well, under the TCA requirements, that isn't, yeah? So you need to consider um, whether these goods will not be of UK origin and not be in free circulation, meaning that you could incur an EU tariff when sending them back. You know, this is important things to be aware of and maybe the consideration of custom special procedures or the returns goods relief mechanism, which is in place to alleviate those costs. Next slide, please. Hi, Will, I'll hand back to you now and thank you everybody for listening. Thanks, Paul. A uh, really far uh, overview of um, some of the evidence needed and how traders can, can claim preferential origin. So I hope that's been useful to everyone. Before we head into the Q&A though, it's my pleasure to welcome back Frank Dunsmo from Fujitsu to say a little bit more about the support and expertise digital trader services provides on matters such as this. So Frank, over to you. Thank you, Will. And um, big thank you. Uh, to Paul and Amy for taking us through uh, a comprehensive overview of rules of origin. Um, I think it, it illustrates very nicely for me how complex the world of import and export administration actually is and rules of origin being just one of the policy areas that we need to understand uh, more comprehensively than before perhaps um, in order to be able to be compliant and make sure our declarations are uh, correctly raised. Um, it's a myriad of policies. Um, rules of origin is, is one of them. There are other policies and criteria that you'll need to make sure that you follow. Um, and so the digital trader services were set up to help organizations, particularly those where customs and international trade is now new uh, part of your business. I think we're hinting here that 50% plus of the people on this call have some uh, knowledge of what's needed and others don't um, or have less knowledge. So it's an important area that we we help the community to in terms of education and services and digital trader services is set up to help those types of organizations in particular uh, your normal route may be if you have an internal customs uh, capability customs admin team then maybe you're using that team or for those less fortunate it, it's a question of getting external help so normal route tends to be towards customs agents and intermediaries which is very good they perform a great a great function uh, the DTS was set up really for those of you that are looking to to keep some control in-house um, so uh, there are three main areas I would describe around digital trader services the first one is access to experts um, you're, you're going to need to query and check that you are making the right assumptions and understanding that the right policies etc so we have a panel of experts within um, digital trader services to help you and guide you through that. At the, the second point though, and unique to digital trader services, is smart custom software. And, and what this does is it takes basic commercial invoice information, the sort of information you'll be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and you're familiar with today. And you then put that data, that information into the um, the smart software system via online screens usually. Um, you can use spreadsheets. Um, and what our system will do is it will guide you through that process with a series of questions that are not customs questions. So certainly it will ask you where the goods are from, as in rules of origin, uh, but we then use the information that you've submitted to enrich that data with the relevant codes that are required to raise declarations. So of course, uh, if in our example here for Italian t-shirts, they're coming from Italy, we will then apply codes 300 usually to uh, the preference rate for that declaration to, to make sure that it claims we're claiming EU preference rate and you're not paying duty on those particular goods. You, you won't see the 300, code 300, we're putting that into the system on your behalf. 
Um, it goes further than that, though. Uh, it will also check all of the other attributes around your particular uh, commodities you're trading. There may be prohibitions and restrictions. So depending on where the goods are coming from, there may be some rules and regulations, and we will bring those questions back to you. So for example, would you believe if you're importing a sofa, one of the restrictions is you can't import a sofa that contains cat and dog fur. So we will look at the commodity code data, bring back a question to you and say, does this product contain cat and dog fur? And if you say no, um, we, we, we then um, enrich your your uh, declaration with the right, um, uh, what's called a Y code, which is a pro prohibition and restriction code that informs HMRC it, it complies with the regulations. Um, so that's pretty unique to the DTS and it allows you to look after your, your customs more in-house. The third uh, area that we look at, we've also uh, including is um, uh, reporting and the analytics around your portfolio. Uh, and essentially that's there to give you a summary of the sort of declarations you've been dealing with. Um, are you applying the right preferential rates? Um, it is the data in order? Um, and are there areas where you could improve or reduce cost within your, your supply chain? Uh, and finally, um, what we're also developing, and this is very much in the pipeline at the moment, um, I think it was uh, uh, Paul that showed you an extract of the Commodity Code database, uh, which is a fantastic database. It tells you um, all of the information you need in terms of imports and exports from various countries, etc. Um, but for those of you that that's new, uh, are new to that area, um, it's it's a little bit daunting to navigate sometimes. So we'll be putting um, uh, a, a smart uh, commodity code lookup function into the service in the coming year as well, which will actually summarise in a in a more legible fashion all of the attributes of that particular commodity you're trading and help you through the process in a more informed way. Um, so I hope that's given you a, a nice heads up. And on the next slide, I think, um, well, if you're yeah. interested in digital, thanks, if you're interested in digital data services, then please um, follow up with a, 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 an offer of a consultation. Thanks, Frank. And just uh, while people are answering that, what, what might that sort of consultation involve? Um, well, in 10 minutes, you can't cover an, an inordinate amount of uh, um, uh, the topic, but um, and it's not exactly 10 minutes, but um, it, it's really a, a discussion with one of our uh, customs consultants, somebody like myself or one of my colleagues uh, around your particular situation. Uh, what is it you're um, concerned about? Uh, and is digital trader services and the, the actual service itself something that would fit uh, your particular circumstances and how, how would it be of value to you? And then we can explain a little bit more about digital trader services and how we can help. Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, it sounds like a very useful resource to people. So I hope I'll leave out a uh, poll running for a few, uh, a couple of minutes just as we go into the Q&A. Um, so um, just to say, we have had absolutely loads of questions come through. So we've had a few hundred, it seems, even during this live webinar. So uh, please bear with me if I <clears throat> if I don't get to your questions today. Um, my apologies, but I'll be doing a limited time. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to group questions together where possible um, and ask themed questions rather than going to uh, everyone's specific questions, because I think that's just going to be unfeasible. So the first one I'll ask is around evidence. Uh, an example of the questions we've had about evidence comes from Denise, who said, what evidence do I need to support, to, to provide to support an origin statement? So an important clarification of this really, but Paul, do you want to start on that one as you covered that in the presentation? Sure, Will, sorry, just trying to unmute myself then. Um, so in regard to supplier declarations, what you need, um, I suppose it's really important here just to engage with your supply chain where you're getting your services from. Um, remember that supplier declarations feed into your rules of origin as documentary statements of proof. To claim that your, your claimant is correct to, to get this benefit of preferential goods. Um, if you're a supplier, you may need to be asked to provide suppliers' declarations to your customer to prove, you know, that your goods meet there, that you've processed or added value. Um, if you export the goods, um, then you may, may need to get suppliers' declaration to prove the origin of the materials 
what was a manufacturing processed um, finished goods that you potentially buy and export. And when we look at this, um, long term supply declarations have been there for a very long time. EUR ones um, noted as with clear boxes which will determine that, whether it's shipment specific or whether it would be um, generally for products that you source from that element and they should you know be very beneficial to your operations so giving you confirmation of the tariff tariff headings of the materials used um ensuring that um they have not exceeded specified limit um also it will cover materials in ex excess of the limits which we're looking at um, and really to understand the basis of that product, which then can fit in to those preferential statements you may you want to make. It backs up your claim and one of the requirements which will be needed from the 1st of January next year. Uh, thanks, Paul. I'm just going to close that poll on the next slide. Uh, we'll, you'll see that we are very much in the Q&A part of this. Um, but just picking up on what you're saying, so it does seem as though there's an awful lot of documentation people need to keep um, as evidence for, for preferential claims. And I think it feeds into the documentary requirements for declarations in general. I wonder, Amy, what tips do you give to companies in terms of just ensuring they've got all the, the paperwork, documents or evidence they need in one place and making sure that's accessible? Absolutely great question. Well, I think that's, crucial to any company who wants to issue preferential origin so remember the onus for ensuring that goods meet the rules of origin falls to the exporter so for a, a uk company buying from the eu as long as they have statement on origin on the invoice that proves the goods are of preferential origin there's little else for them to do it really is incumbent upon the exporter to make sure that they've got evidence to suggest and to, to prove that their goods meet the rules of origin. So it comes down to, um, you know, uh, accounting systems and um, any other process that you might have in place to make sure that you capture the, the origin correctly. So if you've got an, a max norm rule, um, where are your calculations to say that your goods meet those rules? If you've got a CTH rule, where's your evidence of the commodity codes that you hold on file and that have been used in production? So um, it really is incumbent upon the exporter to make sure that they have good records and accurate records, and that's that's the key. And bringing it back to the imports, I mean, I think Frank, you alluded to it, but it's I mean, importers presumably need some who are new to these processes will need some sort of level of support just to kind of get their heads yeah. around all these different requirements. Yeah, yes, very much so. And, and I think um, just adding to Amy's point there. Um, you need to be diligent on this as well. So just go back to our Italian T-shirts. If they arrive and they say made in Vietnam inside the T-shirt, then you need to be convinced that they have been correctly qualified as an EU good from your supplier. Otherwise, you as the importer are liable for that duty uh, if they're not EU goods at the end of the day. Um, so you do need some diligence on that on that process. And, and the other aspect I would say about the records is uh, the the processes tend to be a little bit fragmented from time to time so those that are using external agents etc to to process declarations and and um, uh, documents for them maybe freight forwarders etc um, you do need as the as the ultimate buyer and purchaser you're the importer you're you're the one that carries the liabilities to make sure you've got copies of those documents and 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 uh, 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 and uh, information packs uh, so that you can keep those copies as well so so do do think about collecting that yourself rather than pointing to an external agency that might have the information for you. Will, could I just come in there for a minute? Is that be okay? Um, yeah, other things which I've noted through, you know, long term in international trade is certain of your ERP systems you have in place do allow you with the origin to upload those declarations. So that could be a source of central record keeping. I would also really suggest engaging with your procurement department because they're going to have the contacts with the suppliers so it's kind of so much not related from an international trade perspective but aligning business processes controls and getting them to reach out to make sure these are done and renewed when they are needed as well thank you say so quickly before i move to the next question erp what does what does that stand for 
uh, <laughs> basically it's it's an inline online system it's electronic recording of movement data so you usually have certain sections for international trade exporting um, info records for your your standing data and usually in there you would have a supplier list against a supplier you would lodge into um, you know and log into there the supplier declarations you would have for those components that you're moving great thanks paul uh Time is it for yes, and so I'll move on to a couple more questions. Uh, so a few, loads of questions around processing. This one is from Kim, who's asked, how can origin be changed by processing components from multiple sources? Uh, Amy, do you want to kick off on that one? Uh, isn't that the million dollar question? So the first thing <laughs> I always say is um, check your product specific rules. So from a, from a preferential standpoint, and in order to make sure that you can register your duties, check the product specific rule that applies to your to your product to see what it is that you need to do to that product to make sure that it qualifies um, and then you need to check whether you meet the rule and you can do that um, using the information that we've given you in the in the webinar today from an on preferential standpoint um, you know how can origin be changed by processing components um, if you're producing goods for export uh, you need to have sufficiently worked or processed those goods um, so just by virtue of the fact you've processed them should be enough to give them UK origin. Um, but again, you know, back to the point, um, the first thing to do is go back to your product specific rule of origin and just make sure that you're able to demonstrate from a preferential standpoint whether you meet that or not. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'll move on to uh, a couple more questions. Shall I just launch a quick poll um, just while we're going through the next few questions? So we just want to get a sense of what help um, you in the audience would like in terms of uh, preparing for completing declarations in 2022. Options there include automation of declaration submission, in-house skills training, access to customers experts for support, uh, support access in custom special procedures or other. And feel free to type in the, uh, the question bot uh, any other um, things you may be saying. Next up though, we've had a few questions around who pays duties if origin isn't included in the preferential agreement. That, that particular question from Vinesh, but a few people have asked similar sorts of questions. Uh, Frank, yeah, who pays? Who pays it, the duties? It, it, uh, thank you. Well, it's the declarant. Um, so uh, depending on what we call inco terms. Um, so typically it's the person doing the import. Um, so if, if you're based in the UK and you're the one that's responsible for the import declaration, then you're the one that's liable for uh, duties. Um, if you are purchasing the goods in, the only exception to that is if you're purchasing the goods um, from a supplier in the EU under um, DDP terms that deliver duty paid, then they are responsible for the import declaration and the duties themselves. That's the only exception. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we've had a few questions around non-preferential uh, rules of origin, which we've not really covered so much in this webinar. Um, but uh, Amy, do you want to say just a few words about kind of the relevance of them for UK EU trade and what traders need to know about them? Absolutely. Um, so non-preferential origin, as we said, that's the origin that you would normally just add on to an invoice, you know, as a shipper. Um, and that normally doesn't have any any impact on the um, the normal tariff that would be due on goods. Um, it might impact whether import and export licenses would be required for goods. Um, in order um, to determine whether your goods meet, you know, what the non-preferential origin for your goods are. I mean, there's guidance on the government website. Um, very loosely, you need to have sufficiently worked or processed your goods in the UK um, for them to have UK non-preferential origin. So. It's not just as simple as um, sourcing goods from multiple places, assemble them, assembling them in the UK, and then saying they have UK origin. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and it's something, I think, at a global level, um, that, you know, there's been a real um, struggle to get heads around. And WTO had come out, the World Trade Organization had come out and tried to give uniform rules for it. Um, but, but put loosely, I guess, if you're sufficiently working or processing goods, that should be enough for them to confer uh, UK or EU origin. Hopefully that helps well. Thanks, Amy. I, th I think it does. And I should probably point at this stage to um, I institutes training courses around origin, uh, which provide more information about it as a topic, um, non-preferential and preferential. And as Frank alluded to earlier, obviously, uh, if you've got further questions about non-preferential origin as well, um, obviously the DTS 
gives you access to customers expertise and support uh, I'll do one last question um, just while this poll is running. Uh, we've had a few questions around Rex and EORI numbers. So this one is from Sharon who asks, if our supplier puts the origin statement with their Rex or EORI number on the paperwork and the paperwork also clearly states the country of origin, do we need to go back further and ask the supplier to provide us further evidence that the goods qualify? Uh, Paul, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, sure. So yeah, really good question there. So thank you. So. Um, you know, for import activities, um, having a Rexiori number at the moment is initially enough to ensure preference is claimed. But you really must note that customs can request support and information to verify this claim. Um, and obviously, with the easement ending on the 1st of January next year, this will come in the need of having supplier declarations. If you are going to get a responsibility that you're going to have as an importer, like Frank said, based on your INCO terms, to be able to alleviate your customs duty, you're going to need proof from the supplier to back up that claim. Um, importer's knowledge is a requirement currently, but we're going to need proof to, to, to obviously move that forward um, with the end of the easement. The best proactive approach to have is to have these in place and update them every 12 months. Do remember supply chains can change. Frank's example he used, yeah, we're getting a shirt from, and it's come from Vietnam, but it's been shipped from Italy. Well, what happens if Italy move all of that production and processing to Vietnam? Then there's no preferential origin that could be claimed. Then you could get extra duties that you would need to pay because they won't be able to prove that. Supply chains are moving all the time. So to have these done every 12 months means that you're up to speed with how your supply chains and external supply chains are working. And do remember, it is mandatory to have this support in evidence from the 1st of January next year. And can I just add to that? Apologies. Sure. Um, so if the supplier puts the origin statement um, on an invoice, the importer can take that at face value. There's no requirement for them to go any further and ask for the supplier to provide evidence. Um, it's incumbent upon the exporter to correctly prove that the goods were originating and it, you know they were correct in adding the origin statement onto their invoice, just to clarify that. Yeah, I think, Amy, we do, you know, we've got to look at best practice as well. Um, for anybody that's importing goods to have them there. Just remember the key caveat with the end of the easement is if preferential origin cannot be proved, then it is the responsibility of that exporter to make the importer aware of it. Yes, yeah, so again, they do have a requirement there to let you know, oh, by the way, this can't be claimed under preferential regions. But again, it is best process to have these in place with your suppliers. You may need them if you're exporting and these certificates of origin to different countries you're going to supply, you know, and list that with the Chamber of Commerce. So it then becomes a best in class operation and to support further exporting activities that you may have um, moving forward. Thanks, guys. I'm going to have to um, cut it off there, I'm afraid. But I'll just very quickly share the results to the poll. Um, so really interesting as ever thank you everyone for answering the poll uh joint top 29 percent saying in-house skills training or access to customs experts for support um obviously you've heard a couple in the line today and uh, as frank has mentioned the dts is experts will also be supporting declaration submissions so that's a great resource 13 percent of you say automation or declaration submission 10 percent of you say support accessing custom special procedures and 19 percent of you saying other um Still time to say what other might mean in the questions, but if you feel uh, obliged to do. Anyway, on that note, we have uh, very sadly run out of time. So on the last slide, um, you'll see that we're, we're going to be wrapping up. So thank you once again to Frank, Amy and Paul for your time today with the presentations and answers. We hope that everyone has found that useful. Just a reminder that we will be sending all registrants a recording of today's webinar along with a copy of the slides. Uh, that would be before the end of the week. Uh, please do get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. But for now, thank you everyone for joining. Please do let us know your thoughts in the exit survey. We hope that's been useful. But for now, goodbye everyone. Goodbye. Bye everyone. <laughs>